Uh, hello, everyone. So, oh, uh, it looks like the pizza just arrived. So, I want to go ahead and uh, grab some here before we get started. We want a pizza. Go, go meet the shy, please. Yeah, somebody yeah. pizza. Charge. We have like <laughs> plenty of today. So. Yeah, a well fed, happy audience. Great, yes. There you go. <laughs> Students are filled by like, free pizza. Indeed. And back over there. <laughs> Yes, we're going to get a little bit of background noise the entire talk from the from the My interview here, uh, it was very St. Patrick's. So it's a bit of a wow, wow. Yeah, it's it's well. the well. students with the show ladies out there. <laughs> show ladies. Yeah, it's a well, it's a. Irish walking stick, uh, awesome. also potentially used as a, 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 a snake killer or a possibly in self defense or whatever. Oh. But, yeah, it's probably there. There was a size walking stick. There's a walk behind. I guess, uh, yeah, we were about that. I think we don't have sound, so let me try to fix that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, actually, there should be some. Well, I asked the, the people online, and uh, somebody said yes. Oh, they, they, they were really listening. I guess so. I mean, okay. just, just told the audience that, no, no, that if, if anyone cannot hear us on Zoom, then just uh, type in the, the chat. Mm -hmm. We are not audible. Mm -hmm. Here, oh, wait, oh, wait, 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 I mean, like, oh, I I see. okay. Oh, it seems like this one is pinned or something. Oh, I got oh, it pinned to somebody oh, else who's not broadcast a little picture. Pin. So, why is you know, like, normally the, the first one that would be you? Wow. Well, oh, I see. Well, it's I think my mic on. Maybe my mic's not on. It won't pick up on I mean, this will this will pick up. It's right. not a, a very powerful mic, but it should pick up. Uh, That's what I thought I was doing. And hello. Yeah, I see it. Should we yeah. talk? Should be on. Yeah. Okay, oh. I think we're good then. Okay. I mean, we don't seem to have the same yeah, technical anyway. problems in yeah. our seminar. So oh, well. the word the word is for you as well. So oh, thank you. Appreciate that. All right. Well, let me uh, let me introduce my my yes yes. Let me get so yeah. So um, I'm happy to proud to invite uh, the professor Robert Duncan. Uh, here to give our, our seminar uh, talk for today. Um, Dr. Duncan received his uh, BS in physics uh, from MIT in 1982 and PhD in physics from the University of California, Santa Barbara in 1988. Um, he is currently the president's distinguished chair of physics at Texas Tech University uh, in Lubbock, Texas. Uh, and he served as a distinguished member of technical staff at Sandy National Labs um, and as a physics professor at the University of New Mexico. Uh, and then also uh, before that was a Gordon and Betty Moore Distinguished Scholar at Caltech. Uh, he was a founding director of New Mexico Consortium at Los Alamos in 20, uh, 2006 and uh, Vice Chancellor of Research at Mizzou from uh, 2008 to 2014. And then uh, Senior uh, uh, VP for Research at uh, uh, Texas Tech University from 2014 to 2017. He currently serves on the Scientific Advisory Board of the uh, United States Air Force and on the uh, what is BPSS? Oh, sorry, biological and physical sciences in space. Uh, okay, physical biological and physical sciences space. It's going accurate. Right? Oh, yeah. Uh, the Cable Survey of uh, NAS, and as a fellow with a board uh, member of the National Academy of Inventors. So, long list of accomplishments, and uh, please give it up for uh, Dr. Bunker. Thank you. It's great to be here, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. No, I'm sorry for the acronyms. I Tried to start the acronym reduction effort, but it became known as ARE and failed. Right. <laughs> uh, at any rate, so it's great to be here today. And, and Alex, thanks for attending my talk too on uh, on Thursday uh, when I spoke to the physics department. But it's great to be here. Um, what I was uh, hoping to do today 
is to uh, talk about a rapid innovation in nuclear physics and engineering. And we're really seeing an amazing time historically. And I collaborate with John Dahl and Brad Jeffries at uh, University of Missouri in Columbia. And these are my group members who I uh, co publish with. Matthew Looney is actually our uh, radiation safety officer, and we work very closely with him on this. And we're looking to expand the collaboration now with uh, Joe Graham's group because of, uh, you know, I think some very exciting things we can do together. Well, um, here, let me just see. Uh, this is a, you know, uh, I should catch on to that. Uh, so, second row down, uh -huh. the other it's the one that has the, the ink uh, right off. Right. Right. It turns the. That's the laser. One, one down. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about so that. So, this, this, this is a so slow monkey test. This is the laser. Uh, this one that has. Uh, oh, my gosh. Oh, okay. 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 Thanks a lot. No? Still not working? Maybe it's still. It might be no uh, focus. Like, no, it's, 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 it's not working. That's why. No, no. <laughs> Let me. Yeah, you, the problem sometimes is that you have to click on this. Oh, I see. So I just, I just no, no, no. Yeah, I try it again. Okay. Yeah. Now it's working. Cool. Well. Thanks so much. Sorry about that. No, thanks again. So, the whole idea is to try to change this bumper stick. Okay. Um, I'm a, a proud Tesla driver, but let's be honest, the car is coal powered. You know, I mean, most electric conversion in the United States is either by coal or natural gas. And it would be wonderful to see some more uh, renewable form of energy or nuclear come in fast. Um, this is going to require a whole new level of genuine innovation. But the new, neat result is that, that that's happening today. So Matt Perfetic was uh, uh, at Google for many years. He headed up their quantum computing effort at Google, and he recently left for this venture capital company just across town in Silicon Valley called DCVC. And uh, he was involved very much in Google's investment in $250 million into TAE, Tri Alpha Energy, in Orange County. Which has recently had a very interesting uh, result announced. But uh, at any rate, um, so when I think about this $5 billion investment in the last two years, during a time when the government investments in about $700 million or $0.7 trillion a year um, is really uh, changing things. You know, there's going to be a lot further expansion and in real innovation here. And if you'd like, um, feel free to get a copy of these slides and click on these links, but it goes into more detail. Uh, TAE just three days ago announced that they have the first plasma results of their B plus boron 11 going to three alpha particles. In fact, that's how they get their name, tri alpha energy TAE. And uh, this result is uh, very exciting because notice there's no radioactive waste in the fuel. Okay, you might have some activation from the um, you know, resulting high energy particles, but, but no fuel associated radioactive waste. And when you look at this reaction, I don't want to go into too much detail on it, but it's over a barn cross section and its Q is about 8.6 MeV, so it's quite energetic. So these light fuel cycles, light element fuel cycles, have a huge advantage of not producing fuel associated radioactive waste the way conventional uranium fission does, for example. So this has created a lot of excitement. And uh, then another one that I think is quite noteworthy uh, from 2021 is when MIT and Commonwealth Fusion Systems in their collaboration uh, announced that they have a high temperature superconductor 20 Tesla magnet that can really make a whole new economy of scale in magnetically confined fusion plasters. And so this was a big, big advance. And there are many others. In fact, uh, I was on a panel with Matt Prevetic in Silicon Valley, and that link is shown here. So if you're interested in this really outstanding revolution that we're in right now, please feel free to go to those links and others. Um, it's interesting because there's, um, I think, a situation now where, you know, three days ago, TAE announced a big result. I would be as bold as to say that I think we're going to have feasibility in light element, 
minimal to no radioactive waste production nuclear energy within the next decade, if not sooner. So it's an exciting time. Well, just as an introduction, one thing that's been very interesting to me is this concept of lattice assisted fusion, okay? Lattice assisted fission and fusion. And uh, um, I was just talking to, to Carlos about uh, you know work that's gone on at the University of Illinois for some time. Uh, George Miley's been very interested in this for quite some time. But when you ask about whether you could ever do anything nuclear uh, and use lattice dynamics to influence that, most people would properly say, no, very unlikely. And the reason is that the lattice time constants are, oh, maybe 0.1 picosecond. Energies are down by about, oh, uh, six, seven orders of magnitude from nuclear energies and nuclear time scales for those reactions. So, you know, nuclear reactions are very fast, very energetic. It's kind of hard to think of the two systems being substantially coupled. But in fact, they are. And they are because quantum coherence in one system influences quantum coherence in the other. And also fields produced by, say, the lattice environment can influence the hyperfine interactions with the nuclear system. So hyperfine interactions such as nuclear Z-mine couplings are understood. Um, and as you get to the SD and SF hybrids, you can get at, at high Z, you can get huge magnetic inductions estimated to be greater than 100 Tesla, even a few hundred Tesla at the side of the nucleus from the lattice. And the MOS power effect discovered in 1961 um, is a fascinating thing. If you're not familiar, um, there's a certain probability that cobalt 57 uh, will decay and create iron 57 in an excited nuclear state. And it's to the ground state transition from its first excited state is a 14.4 keV gamma. And when it does so, there's a relatively high probability that the iron 57 will not recoil. That puts all the energy of the decay into the photon, essentially, because there's no recoil energy associated with the iron 57. And the reason why this happens is there's a high probability that the quantum state of the vibrational lattice won't change through the ground state transition in the iron 57. And that's why you have in the Mossbauer effect this uh, opportunity to see the full energy in the photon instead. And that makes the photon then resonant with more absorption that can occur of other iron 57 nuclei in their ground state to go to the first excited state. So this was a huge discovery by Mossbauer. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize for it. And uh, uh, there are many different sources that lead to this incredible spectroscopy. You can, uh, in fact, even get spectroscopy here we go, at the level of a part in 10 to the 13th readily by, again, this resonant absorption and emission of uh, this low energy gamma ray. In R57, just to put more definitiveness to this, the uh, crystal lattice creates a magnetic induction at the side of the nucleus of iron 57 of about 28 Tesla. Okay. And as we'll see, you can do things like magnon production in the solid state of the iron 57, um, like magnons in, uh, in chromaloid films, that will actually modulate that field, giving a lattice dynamic coupling with nuclear dynamics of the system. And uh, there's also, in addition to the decay of cobalt 57, you can populate this excited state of iron 57 by direct X-ray illumination. And there are other cases in addition to this, but probably the R57 system is the best study in the Moscow effect. And at, about a year ago, I gave an, a plenary talk and then organized a session at the Physics and Quantum Electronics in Utah. And there, what's really interesting is the advent of uh, physics of nuclear uh, electronics, or I'm sorry, physics of quantum nucleonics, I should say. And this is becoming a very popular area of study, especially in Germany. And there's a concerted effort between many Max Planck institutes, universities, and DESI, the nuclear facility in Germany, to study this. So this is really taking off. Now, I don't want to go into too much detail about this, but the whole idea are two papers that I think are really very interesting. 
um, recently published, one in 2021, by uh, by this group, Stephen and company, and they do coherent X-ray optical control of nuclear excitations whoops, uh, by again creating um, perturbations, uh, phase perturbations to the nuclear energy levels by creating magnon excitations that change that magnetic induction from about 28 Tesla to 25 Tesla. And so by doing that with the right timing, one can influence effects related to spin echo light techniques and uh, uh, nuclear Ramsey spectroscopy in the nuclear system that before have been studied in, in atomic systems. And this is an area that I think is showing great uh, opportunity. The other is um, uh, Bockwich has, uh, in this paper in 2021, shown coherent control of collective nuclear quantum states uh, via the transit magnets. I'm sorry, this is Bockwich's work. And the work with the uh, uh, light source work out of Dessie, which we quoted here. So let me ask kind of a compelling question. I don't know the answer to it. But could this also influence novel nuclear reactions and thereby impact the future of nuclear energy science? Don't know yet, but maybe yes. And I'll show you why I think that might be true. Imagine the analogy to atomic physics, okay? Certain molecules, like excited dimer molecules, only are formed when the symmetry of at least one of the molecules, of the atoms in the molecule, is changed by an excited state excitation, okay? And so like xenon chloride, xenon fluoride, uh, uh, many, many other examples of excited dimer molecules. And that's because, again, you change from a symmetry that's non-binding to a symmetry that's binding in the atom when it's placed in an excited state. Well, could you do the same thing in nuclei? Now, granted, the situation in nuclei is you're dealing with a strong nuclear force, but nonetheless, the symmetry changes on exciting states of the nuclei still hold. I don't believe there's been much work in understanding really whether this change in symmetry of nuclear states during low level gamma excitation uh, would be adequate to see a larger cross section or a cross section change for say fusion. But I think it would be an interesting study to take on. Now, recently, around the time I was kind of pondering this and pretty excited by the results of PQE 22, uh, a group at NASA and LEN uh, reported on their measurements of novel D plus D fusion and metals um, at low Deuteron projectile energies, well below where you'd expect there to be any substantial fusion, but under high gamma flux radiation. And the theoretical basis was published by um, Pines and his collaborators. And uh, in deuterated metals, uh, this was reported in NASA in this internal publication, and then in BESREV C in this publication. And what they did was they just said the nuclear screening increases during high gamma flux. They took a kind of semi classical approach of saying you just ionize more electrons, more electrons means more electrons to screen, and thought that that was the uh, nature of this. But then one keeps falling back to say, well, could the gammas also be changing the symmetry of the nuclei that might be involved in the fusion? Speculatively. That I don't know the answer to, but I think it would be an interesting thing to study. And then there was an experiment by Bruce Steinitz and a number of people associated with NASA's Slend State Supply Institute about a novel nuclear reaction for Brunstrom irradiated deuterated metals. Again, it also was published in Fisher FC. At any rate, the whole idea of electron screen in D plus D fusion is pretty simple to understand. Imagine two positive nuclei are approaching. You'd think then that if this occurs in a, in a metal instead of in vacuum, some of the conduction electrons would be attracted to a very high positive field between the two approaching nuclei, and that would reduce the Coulomb repulsion somewhat. And in fact, it does. This has been known for many, many years. But, you know, electrons are identical particles. You're confining them. So just like the confinement of electrons in uh, solid state physics, you'd expect this to be an effect on the order of about the Fermi energy of the metal, not too much higher. And what's been very interesting is that in systems that have been studied experimentally, 
it's been seen to be the screening has been about uh, 25 EV in gaseous uh, materials like E2, maybe 50 EV in deuterated insulators, uh, semiconductors, and noble metals. But there are some off the chart values that have been reported from about 180 EV in beryllium up to about 800 EV in palladium. Why? Well, I don't know. This is well above the metals fairing energy. How can you localize electrons to that level of screening between two approaching positive nuclei? Again, experimentally, it seems reliable. It's not one group that's seen this, but many independent groups have listed a few of the uh, group leaders of groups that have seen this. And the Google collaboration that was funded recently has seen this and published it in archive as well. It's interesting, the Google results were published in archive, but it wasn't published in their Nature article. So I'm wondering if they had trouble getting it past the referees in Nature. I don't know, speculation. But at any rate, uh, Pine shows that this intense EM radiation in metals increases the screening potential. Again, semi-classically due to this uh, increase in number of electrons, either by uh, you know a plasma formation or by confidence that electron screen. And so, at any rate, um, for very high energy fusion reactions, you use a drip in the bucket. Even at 800 EV or so, or, or so, it's still small compared to, say, collision energies in the MEVs. Okay. But at the time where the energy is on the order of the screen potential, then things become very substantial. But I'd warn you, please don't be overly taken by this because um, when these simulations by um, Oh, by like Benio and Forsley, part of this uh, NASA collaboration. When they report these, they say 10 order of magnitude increase in the cross section from the bare cross section to the screening under these levels of uh, 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 flux uh, 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 under a gamma. And uh, but look at the energy of the collision. It's going to maybe 10 kV. Above 10 kV, there's virtually no effect. And at 10 kV, the fusion probability is incredibly small anyway. So notice by their own simulations, they're going from maybe 10 to the minus 30 bars to maybe 10 to the minus 10 bars. That's a big oh wow, you know, but who cares? You know, the point is, like in the Google collaboration, they were going from background neutron flux to maybe one neutron per second from fusion in their configuration. So it's hard to imagine that this gamma and new screening would make much of a difference in terms of any realistic enhancement of fusion energy. I mean, it might help bootstrap, but nonetheless, their strategy's been to bootstrap this way, and it's a very small effect. Um, the hope has been that this effect of the screening potential would be large enough to see something interesting and maybe even large enough because of the high density of deuterons whoops there we go don't want to keep my finger on that but possibly even sorry get back to where it was um possibly even enough of an effect because of the high density of deuterons in these materials in these erbium deuteride titanium deuteride lithium deuteride you're talking about 10 to the 23rd deuterons per cubic centimeter. That's seven orders of magnitude more than you have in, say, a plasma, typically fusion plasma. So, with that much, much greater density, if you could create a collisional based fusion reaction in the solid state, there's a chance that it might actually trigger a chain reaction. That's very speculative. But that's been the hope. And that's something NASA has been very interested in. Because they don't want to fly two football fields worth of lasers or or a big huge uh, magnet system on on a uh, play for nuclear propulsion space. So this was, I think, a interesting comment. I'm glad I didn't make it. But NASA's Lens Space Flight Center announced a fusion shortcut. And it was published in IEEE Spectrum on February 27, 2022. And they stated that lattice-confined fusion may replace the need for big laser systems 
and or huge magnets to achieve future fusion energy in space. Well, okay, that's the dream, but you know, I think still there's a long way to go to realize that. But here's the experiment that they're basing on. And this again, I've already referenced this paper uh, by Science et al. And they use an E-beam from a linear accelerator. The E-beam goes up to about 10 MeV. It smashes into a uh, tantalum target, creates bremsculum, that then irradiates these metallic deuterides, okay? They use both titanium deuteride and erbium deuteride in their experiments. And so, you know, deuter deuterium being the most weakly bound nucleus, um, as soon as you're above about 2.4, MEV with the photon, it'll photos dissociate the deuteron and you'll have neutrons from that source. And they showed in their experiment that the average neutron energy by photo dissociation was about 145 kilo electron volts KV. And this neutron, they claim, they collided with deuterons in this very dense 10 to the 23 deuterons per cubic centimeter to accelerate some of the deuterons to collide with other deuterons and create BD fusion. In their experiment, they scan this beam and hence the resulting uh, uh, gram radiation, gamma radiation, over many different samples. And they measured them with a suite of detectors inside this cave. The cave had to be extremely well shielded because otherwise the noise from the accelerator and the, uh, um, the uh, formation of the gram would be too much and would saturate the detectors. So in this cave, typically seven neutrons out of a million generated were detected. And that's led some to speculate, well, at that low sampling rate, how do you know you're not sampling something of say more astrophysical origin too? So that's that's one concern or criticism. But, uh, but again, I don't think that's very well quantified. So in their data by Steinitz at all. And again, I don't mean to be overly negative on this. I think it's a very exciting result. It may be exactly as they claim, but whenever there's a very exciting result, it deserves absolute careful scrutiny. You know? And so, at any rate, they were seeing this peak at about 2.4 MeV, which is exactly where you expect to see neutron peak from D plus D fusion. But then they saw more things up here, which they really didn't know for sure what it was. They thought it might be Oppenheimer Phillips like neutrons coming off, um, you know, accelerated deuterons towards the uh, uh, titanium or uh, erbium. So that was their, their speculation. So, you know, again, I think it's a very interesting result, but we decided that certainly a result this intriguing, claiming lattice assisted fusion in. A collisionally accelerated deuteron system needed to be really scrutinized as much as possible. Now, the significance uh, of this, um, you can read through this too on your own, but when you start going through the chain, so the gamma is photo dissociate deuterons, average neutron from that is 145 kV, okay, scatters elastically with D with about a three bar cross section to produce deuterium at about 64 kV. Well, 64 kV is pretty low energy for D plus D fusion. When you consider half of that would be the center of mass frame energy in a D plus D collision with another deuteron in the lab frame. When you go through that, this cross section would only be about 17 millibar for fusion. That's pretty prime, okay? And that's one reason I think the whole process may be a bit speculative. And to science and fines and everybody's credit, they're very open with this. But uh, the question is, do those 2.4 MeV neutrons really come from DD fusion from collisionally accelerated deuterons contained inside the lattice or not? That's the big question. Well, then once you do that, the higher energy uh, um, neutrons from D plus D fusion, okay, can collide and create like a hundred millibar cross section. So it gives you away from this 17 millibar uh, bootstrap. There's been some claim, well, okay, well, you've got the photon um, assisted uh, 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 better screen situation. But again, at 64 kV, that's over. I mean, the photon assisted screening uh, ends in about 10 kV. 
So at any rate, um, so our thought was that if this is true, many advantages. One, you can accelerate deuterons to 64 kV in uh, you know most university labs. It doesn't require a big accelerator. So going just directly with that and seeing this uh, scattering induced D plus D fusion, if it really is that, would be extremely fast. And we decided this required really close scrutiny. So we tried a replication attempt at Merck. And uh, this again was uh, collaborative with uh, John Dahl and his group. And instead of using the accelerator, we used the flux trap where there's a very high neutron flux region. And that's about almost 10 to the 14 neutrons per square centimeter per second. But 90% of those are thermal and 10% are fast. Okay. There was some talk about maybe cadmium or something to eat up a lot of the uh, thermals, but there are so many of them. The Radiation Safety Committee said, you know, it's a joke, right? You want to put cadmium and absorb the thermals inside the flux trap of MERC? Not a safe maneuver. So we didn't do that. But the idea here was that the gamma radiation levels in MERC are probably smaller than what they were in science, okay, to be fair. But um, the, the actual spectrum in the reactor is uncertain. In similar reactors, it's been um, about 1% of the major gamma flux in science at all. So this is admittedly a lower gamma flux environment than what they have with their accelerator. Well, so we were doing work with titanium deuteride and titanium hydride. And what we did as our experimental determination was to look for tritium that was caught inside the samples due to DT or DD fusion. And mainly would be DD fusion because the deuteron would be accelerated to collide with another deuteron. And uh, at any rate, after a 50 hour radiation, we did the analysis. And so our diagnostic was a very accurate collection of the tritons produced and uh, as an indicator of the possible rate of fusion energy that occurred. And let me just say before I show you the results of that, our big part at Texas Tech University has been very accurate methods of spectrometry, mass spectrometry, to look at other nuclear products like helium-3. We have excellent separation from DH and in H3, typically our resolution is sub 0.1 millivolton, which for light elements is very good. <laughs> Certainly it's 26 millivolton between helium 4 and deuterium, so that separation is easy. And the most important thing is not so much the spectral resolution, but much more so the stability. And so what we can do is de determine the linearity of this process over a wide range of production of helium-3 or helium-4. But that doesn't really help us in this experiment because in such a high thermal neutron flux, the helium-3 will burn up very quickly and be back to uh, tritium anyway. So at any rate, the point is that uh, we also use our Perkinella quantum simulator and again, very good uh, quantitative extraction techniques. Typically our spectrometers were enclosed in a uh, nitrogen boil off gas flooded enclosure. Uh, and that was simply because even though we would circumferentially weld our pipes or try not to use pipe fittings, we wanted to be sure we excluded the possibility of cooling ourselves with 5.2 part per million atmospheric helium form. Nonetheless, we uh, uh, flooded the area with, uh, with very low, like below 0 0.01 part per million helium four surrounding environments. So if there were any other Unexpected leaks that wouldn't fool us. But anyway, right, now let's get back to the preliminary results between MU and Texas Tech. Okay. Again, the uh, helium 3 would very quickly burn up, so um, to tritium. So we didn't see any helium 3, nor did we expect it. And um, also, if you're interested more in the spectrometry, uh, mass spectrometry, uh, Fourier transform and cyclotronic mass spec. This is an open link, so you can get the full paper there. But um, the accelerated deuterons, okay, uh, also produce, you know, this reaction. Um, and that's where we wanted to detect an increase in tritium. But we also have the problem of just direct capture of thermal neutrons by deuterium 
small cross section though it is to produce tritium, but in this high flux environment, it's substantial. And what we found, uh, we have a 10 to the minus 14 mole accuracy in the tritium determinations. Um, and we did a lot of simulations too. But at the end of this all, we would have expected to see about a factor of seven after we had subtracted the uh, amount of tritium produced just by uh, neutron capture the deuterons, uh, neutron capture by the deuterons, we would have expected about seven times the residual tritium that we actually observed. So we saw no direct evidence of science results in this reactor experiment today. But since we had such a large thermal background of neutrons, we wanted to do more. But right now what we're doing is we're taking the cyclotron at MDO, and we've done a lot of, again, modeling of this whole process. And what we're interested in doing is looking at the tritium produced by the um, neutron collision acceleration at deuterium in this system as well. And in that one, what's really nice is uh, they're all fast neutrons, flux of about five times 10 to the ninth neutron per square centimeter per second, with thermal neutrons that are down by a factor of about 10 to the minus three from that. So unlike the reactor, they're all fast. And we can achieve about a total of one month's of radiation time. We're just starting to count the tritium in these samples. And this neutron flux in the bolt that contains the cyclotron that's used for radioisotope production routinely. Um, from John Brockman's group, uh, Jeffries, Fred Jeffries and all, um, this neutron flux has been very well characterized and published in this paper. So it'll be interesting in an environment where we aren't flooded with thermal neutrons to see if we see tritium evidence of the Steinitz and all effect, because it would be potentially a way of verifying collisionally induced solid state uh, CD fusion. So I'd like to shift gears now uh, quickly to talk about nanonuclear science, okay? And, you know, of course, in <laughs> most nuclear reactors and all nuclear reactors in common use today, you've got macroscopic fuel. So the fission fragments deposit their kinetic energy as heat inside the fuel. So you're left with nothing but the possibility of thermal conversion. You've got to have a primary cooling loop to cool the uh, fuel that's warmed up by this process, and then boil steam and make electricity. But there's a lot of interest in if your fission fuel is below a micron in diameter, these fission fragments will essentially escape. They could be used for direct energy conversion instead of going through a thermal pathway, or, which is really central to NASA's interest, they could be used as direct thrust if you expose the core once you're well outside your uh, uh, habitat, outside your atmosphere. So there's been a big interest in going to this. And just recently, we've attracted an IAC grant with our partners at Lawrence Livermore National Lab and Ryan Weed at Positron Dynamics in San Francisco to look at exactly this sort of thing, feasibility of going out to 500 AU to grab the locational lens point in an exoplanet search using a fission fragment like a uh, uh, propulsion system, rocket. So it's uh, also a safer and more efficient approach because you're no longer dependent upon the um, you know, primary cooling loop. And I'm also very interested in the possibility of doing this with thorium-232 with an extremely low specific activity. 10 to the minus 7 curie per gram. And then only once outside the Earth's atmosphere, going through a cascade to produce uranium-233, that would take a couple months to do. And then the U-233 would be fissile. So there's a way of actually greatly reducing the risk of, say, launching a uh, fissile isotope by launching fertile isotope instead. Um, and this um, concept was uh, described by many authors, but one of the biggest concerns that we had was that in this uh, dusty, uh, dusty fission concept by Clark and Sheldon, it was published in 2005, they were wanting very hard to get this thing to go critical. So they had this big, massive beryllium oxide reflector moderator. We're attempting to eliminate gravity as well. So 
this um, concept of the fission fragment rock reactor rockets dates back to one of our collaborators now, George Chaplin, Chaplin from uh, Livermore. Um, and he published this in 1988. He's a Lawrence medal holder, meaning the top prize in the Department of Energy for his very distinguished work in physics through uh, his career. And uh, then Clark and Sheldon, I already referred to this publication in 2005. Um, I also would point to a problem with the containment. They say they want a dusty plasma, okay? But they want the neutrons to have a short beam free path before inducing more fission, right? Thermal neutrons. But at the same time, they want a very long free path for the charged fission fragments. And that transport scenario is difficult, if not impossible, to achieve. So that's caused us to think of other things than the dusty plasma approach that was proposed by, uh, by uh, Sheldon and Clark. And so what we're working on now is a pyrolyzed aerogel instead to contain the fission material for uh, this possible approach. And there's been some very interesting papers on that. By the way, I'm, I'm a guest editor now for Frontiers in London, and we'll be publishing a whole volume on this sort of thing soon with the alternative nuclear pathways that we'd like to pursue. So this was simulations by Sheldon and Clark showing the advantage, again, if the thickness in micrometers of your layer of U-235 uh, oxide, for example, is less than about two microns, less than one micron, the probability of escape of the fragments from the fuel is almost 100%. And they even went further to calculate the warming effects of the fuel as a function of the size of the total power of the reactor based upon the radius of the fissile dust inside their dusty plasma system. So there's huge advantages to make this work. We've also done some simulations using uh, Monte Carlo in particle based code. Um, this has been done primarily by uh, Andrew Gillespie and Chukun Lin in my group. And there they have a UO2 cylinder of a thickness shown here. And uh, the question has been in fission, how much of the fragment escapes? And if you're below one micron, the escape probability is virtually 100%. So there's very little heating in the fuel as well, which is another big advantage. So the idea of a novel metallic deuteride moderator, um, is getting kind of close on time. So we'll see a lot more in data on this, but you could imagine going to, uh, again, nanoparticles, okay, that scatter very efficiently neutrons. And uh, in these confinement experiments with uh, um, with uh, aerogels, these can be interpenetrating. And um, so in the work we've done so far, we've looked at thorium-232 as a very low level alpha particle emitter using the alpha particles as a surrogate vision fragments. And you'll see why we need a very strong magnetic field and the MRI machine won't let us go critical down there, as you might imagine. It's probably true. So at any rate, in these tests with our collaborators, the ejecta, in our case, alpha particles as kind of a surrogate uh, um, fission fragment in the strong field forms a larval radius. And so the momentum along the axis of thrust is preserved since the particles don't just go crashing into the wall. And the rigidity typically of fission fragments, whoops, is about uh, 0 0.6 to 0 0.7 tesla meter for the fission fragments from uranium 235 fission. And it's 0 0.33 tesla for the alpha from uh, thorium 232. This means that under a tesla, three tesla field from our FRI magnet, okay, we're able to realize a, a alarm or radius of about 11 centimeters for the thorium alphas and about 24 centimeters for the fission fragments. And we're only doing surrogate work because uh, only working with one specific activity radioactive is not fission fragments in the, in the MRI machine. And um, we're using various particle detectors, and that development's gone very well on the ends, including Elgin simulators and soon CR39. So this shows 
actually the vacuum cam for this uh, um, kind of uh, test of the containment and thrust concept of the fission fragment reactor with pumps associated. This shows where the alpha source someday will be contained in aerosol. Currently, it's not. It's just micron sized thorium particles um, that are on the front surface to an adhering substrate. And these uh, fission fragments that are detected by simulators, we're not using, um, um, you know, we're, we're using photodiodes essentially to plug this further away because of uh, the problems with the three Tesla field and uh, photomultipliers. So we're using solid state detectors instead. But these tests, this actually shows one of our preliminary tests where we have to prove that we're not going to destroy the imager. So we do some experiments with all the technical materials to show that everything stays in control and we can do this uh, measurement safely. But um, at any rate, these uh, uh, these tests are going on as we speak and looking pretty promising. Finally, I have just about 10 minutes, five minutes left. Yeah, five minutes. Five minutes, sure. Well, I want to talk about probably the thing that excites me the most. And you heard about the proton on beryllium 11, on um, boron 11 for TAE and the success they're having. I think there's another light element fission fusion pathway that's even more exciting. And this is the one we're pursuing now. It involves taking lithium-6 and capturing a thermal neutron. Then you create a triton of about 2.6 MeV energy. And you can use it in one of two ways. Either to fission, whoops, either to fission the uh, lithium-7, okay? So lithium-7 can be struck by the triton and fission, or just VT fusion, you might say TD fusion instead in this case, because the triton is accelerated, hitting the stationary deuteron in the lithium deuteron and creating fusion energy. It starts with a huge cross section, about 400 barns for the thermal neutron capture fission on the lithium six. And the secondary reactions are shown here. And notice that where in the uh, science approach, there was a 17 millibar cross section that was very small. All the cross sections in this approach of collisionally induced lattice confined fusion fission are very large in comparison to that. And um, so, you know, this just shows an in depth uh, cross section as a function of energy. First for the lithium six, the 400 barns at about 26 milli electron volts. And then for the uh, fission path on lithium seven, cross section of about 1.1 bar and 1.9 MeV. And then finally, for the fusion path, the cross section just under 10 barns at about 100 kV. So it's interesting. <laughs> this would be much more preferred, as you can see from the radical change in cross section with energy, much more preferred if you were at uh, relatively lower center of mass energies for the beams and fusion, but the fissions preferred at higher energy collisions. Notice that the cues of these reactions are large as well. Well, we did an experiment where we placed different columns of lithium, lithium hydride, either protium or deuterium in a column that was right on top of a two millipure California uh, 252 source and uh, spontaneous fission source producing about 10 to the six neutrons per second. Then we had a neutron spectrometer, we had different neutron counters, and also a gamma counter as well. And in this experiment, we had great neutron versus gamma discrimination for those of you who do neutron spectrometry, it's pretty good. And in all of these, it's about 660, uh, about 0 0.660 kV per channel in the horizontal dispersion. But what's interesting, and when I said I had data, look at how very strongly attenuated the lithium deuteride is in attenuating the neutron spectrum. The lithium's pretty strong as a uh, moderator too, but the lithium deuteride is a huge elastic collisional moderator as well, as we saw in our intensity as a function of energy in the uh, spectrum, the uh, neutron energy stuff. Well, we normalize to the, you know, 
total number of counts or to the peak, and we found that there is a systematic associated with how we normalize. We haven't completely worked out yet. But what we are seeing is up to about 2 MeV, a substantial increase in the neutron energy spectrum from the experiment I just showed you, when we have lithium deuteride uh, versus lithium, or lithium deuteride versus the empty net, and much less so for just lithium element itself in the empty net, which seems to point to a substantial yield of neutrons from the secondary reactions. So I'd love to repeat these data, possibly again in the thermal neutron uh, port to create the excitation of the 2.7 MeV tritons. Okay, no nuclear waste from this fuel. If all tritons are consumed, <laughs> no the tritons are trapped for getting rid of recycling them and bringing them back into our interviews. And so, could a supercritical chain reaction ever be sustained? Maybe not, because if you have equal probability of the two branches just on the lithium deuteride, then you would have about 1.5 neutrons out for one thermal neutron capture. So the neutron number is not very favorable. But if you wanted to, at the risk of having a little fuel related nuclear waste, you could go to N2N -N process on like the erbium deuterides, okay? And that would provide very fast moderation above 8 MeV for the 14.1 MeV fusion neutron. And there are other spallation strategies that might increase the neutron number as well. If not, subcritical devices may still show excellent, excellent neutron gain. So there are strategies that might bring this critical, but even if not, subcritical might be a very useful power amplifier. And then better mass and energy conversion than U235 fission. And why I say that is if you take the Q of the reaction divided by the initial reactant mass times C squared, that's 0.019% for U235 fission, 0.18% for this lithium deuteride cycle. So roughly twice the mass to energy conversion efficiency. Now, here I just show what the global production of lithium is. And uh, now we're already at scale in terms of lithium processing for electric vehicle car batteries. Okay, a 75 kilowatt hour lithium ion car battery, like in a Tesla 3, has 8 kilograms of lithium, about 1.15 kilomoles of lithium. If you took just 11% of that from a single battery, including all the lithium 6, so you'd have to isotopically separate the lithium 6 then you could produce 4.2 times 10 to the 7 kilowatt hours of energy, assuming a 35% thermal to electric conversion rate. That's enough to fully charge from 0 to 75 kilowatt hours, 184,000 cars, resulting in over 45 million driving cars. So this is potentially an approach to really coming to scale without putting big demands on the ailing power grid for future uh, electric vehicle conversion. And deuterium is in plentiful supply, 160 parts per million in water, but it's not quite at that level of an industrial scale. But I'm very excited about the fact that lithium is at an industrial scale. So lithium battery recycling is soon to become a very big industry, and tagging on to that industry could be beneficial. So th these are my conclusions for the talk. You can read them here um, from what, what I discussed over this last hour. But my main punchline is our energy climate and sustainability crisis, in my opinion, has been induced more by a prior in innovation and inventorship crisis in nuclear science. It's been very hard to innovate in the past. But now with $5 billion over the last two years of private equity investment and a big boost in $700 million a year increase in the investment from uh, the federal government, I think we're about to change that. And I think it's very likely, whether it's TAE or maybe the pursuance of this cycle, we're likely to have something much better than we've had in the past. Well, thank you. And if there's any questions, I'd be glad to answer. Thank you.